Welcome to NTD News. Kevin Hogan here. Let's take a look at today's top stories. A horrific shooting at a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado that left 10 dead. A shootout followed the rampage and a suspect has been taken into custody with an investigation ongoing. Senator Ted Cruz criticizes President Biden's lack of transparency at the border. He says Biden's team denied his request to bring reporters when he visits the border later this week. A Democrat on the House Ethics Committee is disagreeing with Nancy Pelosi. He says Pelosi should not try to overturn a close House race in Iowa where the Republican candidate was already certified. The man charged with killing eight people in a Georgia shooting rampage across three spas faces additional charges. That and more on NTD News. Yesterday in the early afternoon, a shooter opened fire in a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. Tragically, the shooter killed 10 people, including a police officer who had been in the force for about 10 years. Here are the details. Suspect in the building. This is the Boulder Police Department. The entire building is surrounded. I need you to surrender now. At around 2.30 p.m. on Monday, 911 calls came in reporting shots fired at the King Supers grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. He went in the store. He went right down there. Oh, my God. Guys, we got people down inside King Supers. Officer Eric Talley was the first to arrive on the scene. Ten minutes later, officers radioed in that they were in a gunfight. Look, there's... Holy the gunfight lasted about a half hour with one officer saying the shooter had a rifle. The police commander gave an update. There is no ongoing public threat that we do have a person of interest in custody. That person was injured during the incident and is being treated for the injuries. A woman inside the store during the shooting relives the dreadful experience. We were um, at the checkout and shots just started going off and I heard the the, part of, the first one shocked me, and the second one I knew for sure it was a shot. And I said, Nicholas, get down. And uh, Nicholas ducked, and uh, we just started listening. And there was just repetitive shots, and then there was uh, the brief uh, like pause. And I just said, Nicholas, run. And he said, no, don't move. I said, run right now. We have three seconds, and he started running. The police chief described the carnage of the fateful day. We know of uh, 10 fatalities uh, at the scene, including one of our Boulder PD officers by the name of Eric Talley, who's been on the Boulder Police Department since 2010. He's served in numerous roles supporting the Boulder Police Department and the community of Boulder. The police chief said they will work around the clock to bring a resolution to the shooting. The district attorney said an investigation is underway at the crime scene and with interviews. He calls on Americans to send families of victims their thoughts and prayers and describes what else he's going to do. We're going to go all out to ensure that the right result is reached. And that's why I'm very grateful that we do have local, state and federal agencies all responding to this location here today to ensure that the investigation is thorough and complete and ensures that we reach justice. The DA says they will share that information from the investigation with the media and the community when they have it available. And some updates just in. The victims were men and women between 20 and 65 years old. The 21-year-old suspect from Arvada, Colorado, Ahmad Alyssa, was sent to the hospital for a leg injury. He's now in stable condition. He's charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder and is expected to be transported to the Boulder County Jail later today. There's no word of a motive yet, but officials say they will share information as it becomes available. Our hearts go out to the families of the victims. A New York resident is dead and a firefighter is missing after a huge fire swept through a senior care home in a New York City suburb. Residents have since been evacuated Part of the building collapsed under the flames. The Rockland County Fire Coordinator told CNN that a firefighter was on the third floor trying to rescue residents when he was trapped. Firefighters could not locate him. Around 20 residents were rescued and another 20 were taken to a hospital. Two firefighters were also taken there for treatment. The facility housed 100 or more people. Authorities are still trying to confirm all of their whereabouts. It's still unclear what caused the blaze. 
Republican Senator Ted Cruz is calling on President Biden to allow free and fair reporting at the border. He says denying the media access is hiding the truth from the American people. Senator Ted Cruz criticized the media ban at the border Monday. He says it equates to hiding the truth from the American people. He tweeted, that's why I'm calling on Biden to commit to allowing free and fair reporting on the crisis at the border. Cruz plans to visit the border Friday with a group of senators. He writes, it's not enough for members of the Senate to see what's happening. The American people must see. That's why I requested the members of the media be allowed to join us. But your administration clearly and emphatically refused to offer press access. This is outrageous and hypocritical. We reached out to the White House for comment but haven't heard back. On Monday, CNN asked the press secretary about the recent photos taken inside a border processing center in Texas. Does the president believe that these conditions are acceptable? No, he doesn't. And that's why he wants to move children as quickly as possible out of the Border Patrol facilities. They're not meant for children. And that's why he wants to open more shelters. He wants to increase and expedite processing at the border. And this is a, an issue he's focused on every single day. A Democrat congressman says no to contesting a House race in, in Iowa. He's disagreeing with his party's leadership as they aim to get the results overturned by state election officials. Congressman Phillips is taking issue with his own party's leadership. He says top Democrats in the House shouldn't try to overturn an Iowa election result. Iowa officials certified Republican Marionette Miller Meeks over Democrat Rita Hart by six votes. Phillips tweeted, losing a House election by six votes is painful for Democrats, but overturning it in the House will be even more painful for America. He added that just because a majority can does not mean a majority should. Phillips sits on the House Ethics Committee. He's also part of the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus. Democrats started the House race investigation after committee vote along party lines. Attorney Mark Elias represents Hart. Elias has represented Democrats in election cases across the country following the 2020 election. He also represents Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren. She chairs the same committee that's investigating this Iowa House race. Republicans on the committee wrote a letter to Lofgren pointing out the problem. It details what they call a serious conflict of interest regarding Mark Elias. It points out that Elias represents the decision makers and contestants in the case. The Constitution allows for the House to judge election returns. The fate of the seat may ultimately be decided by a vote from the full House chamber. If that happens, moderate Democrats would make up the swing vote and likely decide the outcome. We have an update on the brutal shooting that took place near Atlanta last week. The accused man is now facing additional charges. Here are the details. The 21-year-old man accused of killing eight people, predominantly Asian women, in Atlanta last Tuesday, is facing additional charges of malice murder and aggravated assault. That's according to the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office, which said Monday its deputies were still investigating the crime and gathering evidence and would not be making further comments on the case at this time. Malice murder is an offense in the state of Georgia which alleges implied or expressed malice. Robert Aaron Long was chased by police and taken into custody just hours after last week's violent rampage across three spas in the Atlanta area and has been charged with eight counts of murder. Long had suggested to investigators that a sex addiction led him to carry out the deadly shootings. But the murders have shaken the Asian American community, who rallied in cities across the U.S. over the weekend, bringing a surge of recent hate crimes against Asians back into the national spotlight. The governor of South Dakota is defending girls' sports against what she calls unfair competition from biological boys. This, as more than 20 states are considering doing the same. NTD's Allison Lee has more on that. South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem is announcing a coalition that seeks to defend Title IX and stand up against potential backlash from the National Collegiate Athletic Association, or NCAA. The coalition will uh, consist of athletes, leaders, and everybody who cares about protecting women's sports. Once we have enough states on board, a coalition brought big enough where the NCAA cannot possibly punish us all, then we can guarantee fairness at the collegiate level. The governor says this new initiative is necessary because legal scholars predict that South Dakota will very likely lose in the case of a lawsuit against the NCAA. If South Dakota passes a law that's against their policy, they will likely take punitive action against us. 
That means they could pull their tournaments from the state of South Dakota. They could pull their home games. They could even prevent our athletes from playing in their league. That's their prerogative. South Dakota passed a new bill earlier this month. It would restrict girls' sports to biological girls, but Governor Nome sent it back to the legislature and asked them to make certain revisions. I'm still excited to sign the bill. Nothing's changed. Some of those uh, portions of the bill that we need to fix are those that create a trial lawyer's dream. Uh, there are incredible opportunities for lawsuits and litigation in this bill that don't need to be there. She says, for example, the definition of performance-enhancing drugs in the bill is too vague. She wants to limit the bill to K-12 through sports, not the collegiate level. And the governor also says an athlete's gender should be proven using the birth certificate at the time of birth. Instead, the current bill would require families to prove their children's gender every year. Over 20 states have introduced similar legislation, and Mississippi's governor already signed one into law. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. U.S. Representative Mo Brooks of Alabama says he plans to run for the Senate in 2022. Brooks led the Republican effort to challenge the 2020 presidential election results in Congress. Brooks launched his campaign at a rally in Huntsville, Alabama, where he was joined by Trump advisor Stephen Miller. Brooks is a close ally of former President Trump. At Monday's rally, Brooks claimed Trump was a victim of election fraud. He said the 2020 contest saw the worst voter fraud and election theft in history. Trump easily won Alabama in November's presidential election, so a Trump endorsement will likely make him the favorite to replace the Republican senator who's retiring. A former Trump administration intelligence official says the federal government plans to release a report sharing more information about UFO sightings. Former Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe told Fox News that he wanted that information made public before he left office. The report can now be released since it was included as part of the latest stimulus bill. Ratcliffe said objects have been seen by military pilots or satellites and they do things that are hard to explain or replicate. He noted that there have been more of these sightings that haven't yet been made public. Fox News host Maria Bartiromo said the report will come out on June 1st. And coming up, fitness centers in New York City can now open in-person classes again, but the city's mayor doesn't support the move. And a Chicago hair salon kicks off a fundraiser to support local law enforcement. She says it's her way to give back to them. That and more on NTD News. On Monday, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to consider reinstating the Boston Marathon bomber's death sentence. The 2013 attack killed three people and wounded more than 260 others. Jurors in 2015 had sentenced Jurnayev to death for helping to carry out the deadly 2013 bomb blast, but an appeals court later ordered a new trial regarding the sentence he should receive. That ruling was in turn challenged by the Trump-era DOJ, which, in an effort to reinstate Jarnayev's death sentence, argued that the appeals court's decision should be reviewed by the U.S. Supreme Court, which it will now be. President Joe Biden's administration has given no indication it plans to reverse the Trump administration's approach to the case, as it has done in several other cases pending at the court, despite Biden having said on the campaign trail that he would seek to end the federal death penalty. Jarnayev and his older brother, Tamerlan, detonated two homemade pressure cooker bombs at the Boston Marathon's finish line in April of 2013. Three people were killed and over 260 were injured. A massive manhunt ensued in the days that followed. The two brothers, while on the run, also killed a police officer. Jarnayev's brother later died after a gunfight with police. The justices will hear oral arguments regarding the DOJ's appeal and issue a ruling in in the court's next term, which starts in October. Police officers face more criticism and hostility from millions of Americans and activist groups. But one salon owner is hosting a fundraiser to support them. NTD's Don Tran has the details. Police officers vow to serve and protect. That means looking out for the people and businesses in their communities, like this hair salon in Chicago. Katie Shiko, the owner of the salon, has lived in Chicago for over 20 years. She hosted a fundraising campaign on Sunday to show her gratitude to the police officers who keep her and others safe. So this is my way to give back to them. 
In 2020, 15% more Chicago police officers retired than the year before. The same trend happened in other major cities like New York and Minneapolis. In early March, two Chicago police officers committed suicide in one week. Rob McDonald had a friend who was a police officer. He committed suicide two years ago. There's a level of, of stress and a level of, um, you know, just an extra layer of difficulty for doing a job that's already difficult. One police officer and his wife said it has been a very difficult and stressful year for them. Because when you're working uh, 12 and 19 days in a row without having off, and those days that you're working are 12 hour days, uh, you know, it, um, it wears you down, it wears your family down. You have to pull it together. You have to be supportive and you have to be strong for your husband who is doing a really hard job and sees a lot of things that people don't see and I don't think people understand. Schickel said there's been a lot of negative coverage of police officers and that officers are underappreciated for what they do. Police, I think that, you know, we need to counteract that with positiveness and an appreciation and, and gratitude for, for the job that they do every day for all of us. Schickel's hair salon charged every haircut $25 on Sunday, and she's keeping none of it for herself. The donations proceeds will all go to the Chicago Police Memorial Foundation to purchase new bulletproof vests for Chicago Police Department officers. Don Tran, NTD News. And the country continues to reopen. Fitness centers in New York City can now offer in-person classes again. But not everyone's happy about it, including the mayor. NTD's Arian Pastar has the story. Today, in-person classes, like kickboxing for example, are reopening in New York City. So gyms have been open for quite some time, but in-person classes were still banned. Last week, instructors from the yoga, pilates and dance industry gathered in front of City Hall to protest that. They say they were forgotten. New Yorkers we spoke with had mixed reactions to the city's current speed of reopening. We should wait till vaccines are out for everyone um, and then reopen. Like, I also think it's crazy people are eating inside already. Um, I don't think it's time for that yet. I go to the gym with my daughter and we love it. So we're really happy it's open. Uh, I think most of them are closed arbitrarily without much thought or science behind it. Just the politicians being afraid to have it open. I just want the pandemic to be behind us so we can get rid of these masks and like live like normal human beings again. Neighboring New Jersey is halting its reopening. The Garden State has the highest per capita number in cases nationwide. New York City's mayor would like to follow their lead when it comes to indoor dining and other industries. In the city now getting up to 50 percent, uh, certainly we got to stop there. That would be my strong view. The mayor is against bringing back in-person classes. His health team says it's dangerous because people are very close to each other and masks could slip off their sweaty hats. But the governor overruled the mayor's decision, giving in-person classes a pass. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. Major cities in the U.S. are becoming more congested according to a global ranking. Experts say the pandemic might have had something to do with it. NTD's Don Tran reports. In 2020, some of the biggest American cities made it to the top in the country and the world when it comes to traffic congestion. New York City specifically rose from fourth to first place, which means more time sitting in traffic and more hours wasted. Analytics firm Inrix found that New York City drivers lost 100 hours to traffic congestions last year. And one of the city's roads was the second most congested in the country. A professor at Northwestern University said traffic congestion increased in New York City because of the pandemic. People got off of transit because of fear of, of spreading COVID-19. And then as opportunities came to get into the city and get back to work, uh, those that could, more of them chose the car than, had, than had, had been using the car before. Coming in second place is Philadelphia. Drivers there lost an average of 94 hours in traffic last year. Some people in Philadelphia are surprised and even skeptical that their city was at the top of the list. I thought there would be other countries before that or other cities even. But uh, I guess I guess it is what it is and maybe it depends on how it was measured. Um, I'm from India and, and uh, Indian cities are very overcrowded. So um, I thought the traffic pattern in India is much worse than here. So I'm really surprised that Philadelphia ranks so high. I see traffic moving fine. You know, there's other problems besides this.
The report also found that traffic jams cost the everyday Philadelphian over $1,000. A professor at the University of Alberta gave a few suggestions to reduce traffic jams. In some cities where you've got the capacity building infrastructure to you know, put in more lanes, uh, do bypasses and so on, that help, helps a lot, although it's very expensive. In places like New York where you're really quite constrained, uh, basically it's getting people onto transit or getting people to, to simply not travel. Some of the people in Philadelphia said that traffic congestion isn't the real problem. They said the real problem is the filthy conditions and the abuse of drugs in public transit systems. Don Tran, NTD News. Still to come, a California college is closing after nearly 170 years. The school cites low enrollment, poor funding, and pandemic challenges. Current students have a few options. A new crime bill has been raising safety concerns in California. It could change the definition of petty theft in the state. Find out more on NTD News. If you're like me, and I think it's actually most of us, then you're getting really fed up with the nonsense going on inside the banking system. I mean, We've worked hard our entire lives to retire comfortably. We just recovered from the crash of 2008. And it seems like it's about to happen all over again. Look at the too big to fail banks. They're only getting bigger as the Fed hands them trillions of dollars daily, while simple folks like you and me, we're only getting the short end of the stick. That's why I'm glad I found this book called The Bank Failure Survival Guide. Give us a call and we'll send you a free copy with no obligations whatsoever, just one American to another, telling you about some options that you might not have considered. Call 866-239-2619 today for your free copy of the Bank Failure Survival Guide. That's 866-239-2619. The glory of piano masterpieces from the Baroque, classical, and romantic periods New Tang Dynasty Television invites you to join the 2021 NTD International Piano Competition. Together, we preserve and revitalize the art of authentic classical piano music. October 2021 in New York City. Register now at piano.ntdtv.com. Someone has to find a way to build the Great Dome. Completely new, completely original. A private women's college in California will stop enrolling new students after this fall, citing low enrollment and funding. Here's NTD's Eileen Ng with the details. Mills College, a private liberal arts and sciences college for women in Oakland, California, announced last week that it will not be taking new students after fall this year. They cited declining enrollment, budget deficits, and pandemic challenges as reasons for its decision. Mills intends to begin the shift from being a standalone, degree-granting college to becoming an institute that will sustain the essence of Mills College and continue to do what Mills does best, cultivate women's leadership, pursue racial and gender equity, and offer transformative learning and research opportunities to those underserved by other institutions. After nearly 170 years, the school will accept its last undergraduate students. The last graduating class will likely be 2023. During this transition, the school will create options for students to obtain degrees at Mills College or transfer to another college or university. Eileen Ng, NTD News, California. A new crime bill in California seeks to clarify the difference between a petty theft charge and felony robbery. What could this mean for the state? NTD's Jason Blair has the details. Under Senate Bill 82, some robberies could be reduced to petty theft if they don't involve deadly weapons, serious injuries, and the value of the property taken does not exceed $950. Some leaders are saying it would make Californians less safe and encourage criminals to be bolder. 
at a time when we have so many highly visible cases of robbery here, we need more protection. But this bill is just going the opposite direction. There's also concern that violent crime could go unpunished because the legal definition of serious injury is very specific. That means in a lot of cases, when the victim suffers with a black eye, a bloody nose, bruises, and so forth, you know, it, it would still be considered as uh, nonviolent petty theft under SB 82. The bill was introduced by California State Senator Nancy Skinner. She says California's robbery statute is 150 years old and SB 82 will bring more clarity to the definition of petty theft. But what we are finding is because, again, the lack of clarity between the distinction that there are people being charged with felony robbery that judges even feel are, should not, is not appropriate. District Attorney Dan Dow wrote a letter in opposition of the bill. He stated the definition of violent robbery involves the use of force or fear and has never required a weapon or actual bodily injury. He states that SB 82 will essentially eliminate the crime of unarmed robbery by replacing it with petty theft. The bill has been passed by the Public Safety Committee and is now waiting to be heard by the Senate Appropriations Committee. Jason Blair, NTD News, San Francisco. In Washington state, one of the greatest natural wonders is the annual departure of migrating birds in the spring. But the yearly event has brought other issues to the natural environment. NTD's Echo Liu has more on the birds. Washington's Skagit Valley is where hundreds of thousands of migratory birds call home. Every March, they leave from here on their annual migration to Russia. The 3,000-mile journey brings more than massive flocks, as locals also come to see the birds in their natural habitat. And uh, bird watching is the fastest based, uh, the fastest growing nature-based activity in the United States. And so, Andrew Miller, a local entrepreneur, is a firm believer that the birds bring revenue. But as a farmer, Miller also voices his concerns. Problem, but if there's a farmer who has put in uh, winter wheat and you know 20,000 snow geese decide that that's what they want to have for breakfast, well then that's considerable economic loss for that farmer. Conservationists like Jed Holmes also notice issues with the birds. When the numbers get uh, above a certain level, um, it's no longer sustainable. Holmes says the estimated number of birds could be over 150,000 within 50 miles around Skagit Valley. Holmes mentioned options to control the population. You know, one of the things when they're thinking about, you know, harvestable hunting numbers, they're thinking about, you know, not letting, not letting those populations get too high. Holmes so, works with a group of people to embrace economic opportunity to protect both the land and farmers and educate visitors. He is also the co-founder of Birds of Winter. Stephanie Fernandez is part of the group. Yeah, so that's one of the things I like to teach on my, during my birding tours, is how to be uh, a responsible birder. Miller pointed out that people trespass on private property to see the birds. The other issue is really access, and that's, that's something that I think farmers uh, generally Unless it's going to benefit them, it's only risk to have people, uh, especially uninvited, and that would be the number Fernandez has educated people about nature during her 30-plus years of eco-tour guiding. She says people should be more respectful. Keep your distance to birds. Also, you need to respect their habitat they're in, because habitats can be very fragile, or habitat can be a private land like these farmlands. Fernandez said some birders claim that they don't see any sign. The Wildlife Regional Program posts signs indicating both public and private property. Regardless of what the people in Skagit Valley do, the thousands of birds will continue their yearly travels. Reporting by Echo Liu, NTD News, Washington. And just ahead, debates run hot on why Chinese diplomats were so aggressive during their first meeting with Biden officials. An expert sheds light on a possible message behind their actions. And China buys more oil from Iran and Venezuela. The increased imports from China allow the two countries to circumvent U.S. sanctions, throwing a wrench in the Biden administration's foreign policy plans. Find out more in just a moment on NTD News. U.S. and Chinese diplomats recently had their first high-level meeting during the Biden administration. Now, following this, the debate is ongoing over why the Chinese diplomats behaved the way they did. One expert says Beijing's diplomat is, trying, is actually trying to tell the world an important message about his boss's dark ambitions. NTD's Juliet Song has the details. 
How did the well, talks go? The Discussions are hot following the first showdown between the Biden administration and Beijing. Top diplomats from both sides had their first in-person meeting last week. But people are still talking about what's behind some unexpected behavior from the Chinese Communist Party's or CCP's side. Prior to the meeting, both sides had agreed on two-minute-long opening remarks. The U.S. side acted as planned, but top Chinese diplomat Yang Jiechi broke the deal, going on a 16-minute-long monologue and aggressively throwing out accusations toward the U.S. One interpretation being passed around suggests China was putting on a show for its domestic audience. That way, the regime officials would be praised back at home for humiliating the U.S. But a China expert holds a different view. He's using this opportunity, an opportunity where he held the world's attention, to share a message from the Chinese leader. So what's the core message? The message is that the Chinese Communist Party will stop recognizing that the U.S. is the world's leader, and that the CCP also won't follow international rules laid out by the U.S. On top of this, the CCP will promote its own values and directives around the world. Tang says one section of the Chinese diplomat's long speech is particularly telling. In it, Yang said, the U.S. does not represent the world, it only represents the government of the United States. The Chinese diplomat went on to say that neither the U.S. nor the West represent the international opinion. He later added that he thinks a number of countries don't agree with American values or recognize the U.S. as a global leader. The diplomat also stressed one point, that China follows the international order set by the United Nations. But many of the key organs of the United Nations and many of their critical policies are controlled by the CCP. Tang says the diplomat's comments directly challenge the United States' ideology and value system. The CCP is denying the United States' legitimacy. It's also denying the Western values represented by the United States. Put simply, what the Chinese leader wants to say is, the Western values of democracy and freedom are current, but the totalitarian system represented by the CCP and its values is what will lead the future. He called the diplomat statement a declaration of challenge toward Western values. Basically, the CCP is openly declaring that it seeks to dominate the world and promote its system to the entire world in the future. Tan explained that the aggressive speech also served another purpose, to test the Biden administration's bottom line. He says the speech pushed White House officials, looking to see how they'd respond in the face of Beijing's aggressive diplomacy. Juliet Song, NTD News. Switzerland unveiled its first-ever strategy aimed at dealing with China late last week. The report highlighted two key issues, human rights dialogue and trade interests. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more on the story. In its first-ever report on China policy strategy, Switzerland says it wants to create greater coherence with communist China. It also indicates at the same time there are, quote, clear differences in values between the two countries. The Central European nation also emphasizes human rights abuses in communist China. Beijing's embassy in Switzerland denounces the report in response, but Chinese media react differently. Last Friday, the Swiss foreign minister presented the country's China policy for 2021 to 2024. He says human rights dialogue and trade interests are the two key issues. Human rights dialogue and at the same time Switzerland's third most important trading partner. These two keywords have long characterized Switzerland's relationship with China. Human rights dialogue between Switzerland and communist China was suspended in 2018. Switzerland is now willing to continue the dialogue. The foreign minister says, quote, a difficult dialogue is better than no dialogue. He points out that Beijing's willingness to have the dialogue has dropped, while the human rights situation in China got worse. But Amnesty International's annual report suggests that the human rights situation in China has been worsening year after year. This is true even when the regime had human rights dialogues with Western countries. Another key area in the report is the economy. It includes the promotion of trade, investment, export and tourism. 
This approach echoes the Swiss-China high-level meeting earlier this month. Switzerland's finance minister and the Chinese regime's vice premier met and agreed to deepen bilateral ties in stock market trading, asset management and other areas. Both countries' central banks are also working on projects for digital money. Beijing's embassy in Switzerland responds to the new China policy by claiming that China has always attached great importance to human rights protection. And it criticizes Switzerland for, quote, sending a wrong signal to the outside world. But some Chinese media interpret Switzerland's strategy as something positive. China Business News says in an article that Switzerland prioritizes China in foreign policy. The article leaves out the part about different values, but adds an interview with the vice chairman of a Chinese business association in Switzerland. The vice chairman praises the Swiss-China Free Trade Agreement as being very good for China. China is buying more oil from both Iran and Venezuela on the black market. It's a test for Biden's foreign policies. NTD's Patrick Hayden reports. The Wall Street Journal reports China has increased its oil imports from Iran and Venezuela sharply, citing U.S. officials. One industry expert says in a period of constrained supply, China can get discounted oil on the black market from these countries. If the oil's on the market, they'll buy it. Why would they care what the U.S. thinks? The U.S. and China are at a low point in their relationships. China can basically put the finger in the eye of the U.S. Secretary of State in Alaska, put the finger in the eye of the president, Joe Biden, and and that's what they're doing because they can. It's as simple as that. Data company Pleca says China is expected to import over 900,000 barrels a day from Iran this month. That be the highest amount since the U.S. imposed an oil embargo against Iran two years ago. The U.S. has lost any influence with respect to Iran or Venezuela over the last 20 years. This is not a new phenomenon. I don't lay this blame on Biden. I don't lay the blame on Trump. He says over 20 years ago, Iran and Venezuela went their own way. They have their own destiny in mind. They have their own principles and their own authoritarian prerogatives in mind, and that's what they will pursue. He says there is no central trading information system to track oil trade. So a lot of trading can happen, you know, under the table, behind closed doors, uh, where nobody knows it's happening. And then ships suddenly appear uh, empty, fill up with oil in Iran or Venezuela, and then suddenly disappear often with a name change or with turning off of the international navigation system. Hofmeister says China views the U.S. as a declining empire and the regime will do what it wants and only follow laws it deems appropriate for itself. He says the U.S. could send out ships to confiscate China's black market oil, but he warns that could create a heightened level of anxiety and international stress, which could have other consequences. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Up next, Spanish residents share mixed feelings as German citizens vacation on their beaches. Uneven European lockdown policies are helping the Spanish economy, but residents say it's unfair. Do you have a life insurance policy you no longer need? Now you can sell your policy, even a term policy, for an immediate cash payment. Call Coventry Direct to learn more. We thought we had planned carefully for our retirement. But we quickly realized we needed a way to supplement our income. Our friends sold their policy to help pay their medical bills. And that got me thinking. Maybe selling our policy could help with our retirement. I was skeptical. So I did some research and called Coventry Direct. They explained life insurance is a valuable asset that can be sold. We learned we could sell all of our policy or keep part of it with no future payments. Who knew? We sold our policy. Now we can relax and enjoy our retirement as we had planned. If you have $100,000 or more of life insurance, you may qualify to sell your policy. Don't cancel or let your policy lapse without finding out what it's worth. Visit CoventryDirect.com to find out if your policy qualifies or call 1-800-509-8500. Coventry Direct, redefining insurance. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and fighted out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America. 
and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week. France's celebrations for the 200th anniversary of Napoleon's death are approaching, and some say the events should be canceled. But it seems the French emperor's supporters will push on. Entity's David Vives has more. Will France's first ever emperor be the next to be canceled? A New York Times opinion piece on Friday called on the French government not to commemorate Napoleon. The author points out that Napoleon restored slavery to the French Caribbean to build his empire. For the president of Napoleon Foundation, Thierry Lenz, this is indeed a well-known fact. I wrote myself on the question. I am not saying Napoleon was right to do so. He restored slavery for economic reasons at the time and broke a promise that he would not do it. Lenz says there are several reasons behind that. France was the first nation to abolish slavery, but the French emperor turned over on this decree in the Caribbean, where the situation was more complex. The New York Times piece is not the first to make the call to cancel Napoleon. Other groups in France coming from the far left also push the French government not to celebrate the emperor's anniversary. But cancel culture does not have the same momentum in France that it has in the United States. I'm very surprised about this cancel culture, to see Lincoln statues dismantled, Churchill statues dismantled. I can't imagine that happening in France. I discussed it with universities in the U.S. It seems to me that Napoleon still has a great aura there. Lenz says it is always good to improve your understanding of history. He agrees that historians need to revise their perspectives as they learn more of the historic truths. He says the calls to ban Napoleon from history books don't come from historians, but from others with an agenda. This is not about looking for the truth of history. The people asking to cancel Napoleon are not historians. They are activists. They don't want to know about the past. They want to change it or even destroy it. We have to resist. The celebrations will take place as planned on May 5th. The French president did not say if he would participate in the celebrations. But so far, the public's support for Napoleon looks to be much bigger than the opposition which indicates it's unlikely he will be cancelled. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. The controversial mix of lockdown policies in Europe has some going on vacation while others are under lockdown. Locals in Spain say it's not right that their German neighbors can frolic on their shores while they can't. Excited tourists, mainly from Germany, spilled out of Mallorca airport over the weekend. The holiday destination got an influx of travellers after Berlin last week lifted quarantine requirements for those returning from the popular Spanish islands, although the German government still advises against non-essential travel. It's an amazing feeling to be able to be back here and we are very happy that Mallorca has such a low infection rate and that we can come here, said one tourist. We all took a test in the last 48 hours and all of the people on our plane were clean and had taken a test. It's perfect, he added. The return of German tourists provides a timely boost for one of the country's hardest hit industries. Foreign visitors to Spain fell 80% in 2020. The year before, it was the world's second most popular tourist destination with more than 80 million arrivals. The renewed influx of the German tourists was noticeable on Mallorca over the weekend, with restaurants buzzing once more. Tour operator TUI Germany said Easter bookings were double 2019 levels. On Monday, the country's tourism minister said he hoped foreign tourist arrivals would hit half their pre-crisis numbers this year. But the arrivals left some in Mallorca with cause for concern. 
Groups of German tourists were seen partying without masks on the beach, despite restrictions still in place on the island. Some locals were surprised by tourists' behaviour and had mixed feelings about the benefits of their return. A country known for its long, narrow inlets called fjords is working toward another maritime feature, but this one is man-made. Norway has authorized the construction of what officials are calling the world's first ship tunnel. It will take crews up to four years to dig the mile-long, 118-foot-wide tunnel through the Stadhavet Peninsula. Officials hope once it's done, it will help promote commerce. This part of Norway is known for bad weather, and ships sometimes have to wait for days for conditions to improve before they can navigate the Stadhavet Sea. The tunnel is supposed to solve that problem. There are similar tunnels out there, but they're limited to small boats and barges. This will be the first that can handle large ships. Construction is expected to start next year and cost $330 million. An Arctic walrus was spotted on a Welsh coast in a rare sighting on Saturday. Animal rescue experts believe it could have been seen previously in Ireland. The walrus was found resting on the rocks along the Pembrokeshire coast, and some animal charities sent animal rescue officers to observe it. They believe it was the same one spotted in Kerry, Ireland, last week, 300 miles away from Pembrokeshire. An officer from Welsh Marine Life Rescue says the walrus, as big as a cow, is a young one as its tusks are about three inches long. She said it looked rather underweight but uninjured. Ellie West from the RSPCA believes the walrus travelled a long way in search of food. Apart from it being very, very, very surreal and very, very unusual, I have to admit my, my main emotion is feeling quite sad that this poor guy's turned up over here on a very, very long journey, very, very far away from home. After a few hours rest, it headed back to sea and swam away. Arctic walruses are very rarely seen in the UK. West says no walrus has been spotted so far south in British waters. Coming up, a Ukrainian town wants to be called New York again. The war-torn town has suffered from the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Some residents think the name change would bring hope to its people. And surfs up in California. One instructor's furry friend is helping teach kids how to ride waves. Meet Pismo and Grover, the surfing goats, and more in just a minute. If you need a good pep talk, turn to this tiny toddler. At just three years old, she's a skiing natural. Her father says when he taught her his older ski boys to ski, they would talk themselves through the runs. When it was her time to learn, he said he had, he had, he said he had to mic her up. The three-year-old peps herself up as she speeds down the Canadian mountains. When she falls, she gets right back up. And she goes fast, like the boys, she says. Her family says they wanted her to learn how to ski at a young age to build her confidence and resiliency. A town on the front line of Ukraine's war with Russian-backed separatists is having a bit of an identity crisis. They're considering returning to their pre-communist name, New York. There's no bustling Manhattan skyline in this New York in Ukraine. I did not know that there was a New York in the Ukraine, although I'm not surprised. There's names all over, you know. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a Texas in Ukraine. How did a small town in Ukraine come to be named New York in the first place? Historians aren't sure, but they think it came from German immigrants. Russian Empress Catherine the Great invited them in the 19th century, but the Germans were deported when Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union in 1941. And by the time of the Cold War, the name New York wasn't so appealing. The town was renamed amid the Cold War. The reason for it was that the Soviet Union citizens believed that the name of New York was a sign of capitalism. Also, the relationship with the United States was not friendly. So people expressed their unwillingness to live in a town named New York. The town was renamed in 1951. Now some locals are campaigning to change it back. Easier said than done, especially since the town lies on the front line of the war between Ukraine and Russian-backed separatists. Ukrainian soldiers are manning checkpoints less than a mile from separatist lines. They also patrol the trenches on the town's outskirts. More than 100 houses there have been damaged by shelling. Five residents have been killed since the start of the separatist conflict. 
And lately, more and more ceasefire violations are breaking out. We would like to live in a peaceful New York. That's the most important thing for us, a peaceful sky above our heads. And it is no matter what they are going to call the town, it is our hometown anyway and it will not lose its value. Some residents think the time and money would be better spent focusing on unemployment and poverty. Others argue renaming the town would lead to development and economic success. The name New York carries symbolic hope for a return to heritage and resistance against Russian separatists. Learning how to surf can be daunting, but in California, one instructor is using an animal friend to help. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. California surfer Dana McGregor has always been stoked to catch a wave, but he says it was even more rad when he took his pet goat along for the ride one day. I, I feel honestly called uh, uh, like to bring joy to people and to people's lives, and for some reason I got goats, and, and for some reason I took up surfing, and for some reason I have a love for working with kids and it all works together, you know, really well. McGregor spends his time teaching children how to surf and his goats help them overcome their fears of the water. The goats seem to enjoy it too. I think the kids see it and they're like, wow, that's incredible, like I can surf, you know, and, and, and it kind of takes away the fear, you know, of the ocean and the waves and the power behind it, you know, so I think it brings a lot of freedom to people. McGregor's eight-year-old goat, Pismo, appeared relaxed as he hit the waves on a large inflatable surfboard. Fresh from the surf, 10-year-old Malia Robbins was ecstatic. It's really like fun because you get really watery, but first when it's your first time it feels scary, but actually after you keep on doing it and doing it, it's really fun. McGregor runs surf and soccer camps out of Pismo Beach, north of Santa Barbara. That's where he incorporates his pet goats, Pismo and Grover, into his lessons. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. In New York City, I'm Kevin Hogan. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.